Russia has stepped up its rocket attacks on Ukraine with fresh strikes on cities across the country. Authorities say Russian rockets hit a residential building in the capital, Kiev, killing at least three people. The strikes knocked out power supply in the western city of Lviv and disrupted water supply in several regions. Also in neighboring Moldova, officials say power was lost to half of the country due to the strikes in Ukraine. Now, this comes after Ukrainian officials said a strike on a maternity ward in the southern Zaporizhia region on Tuesday killed a newborn baby. Pulled from the rubble of what was a maternity ward, this doctor was fortunate to make it out alive. But the Russian strike that flattened his workplace did take the life of the baby he was there to deliver. Its mother was rescued, just the latest casualties of yet another attack on a healthcare facility. Moscow has long denied targeting hospitals and clinics, but the World Health Organization has recorded more than 700 attacks since the start of the war nine months ago. Russia's repeated attacks on energy infrastructure are making it harder for doctors to provide care at those hospitals that are still standing. Here, in Kherson, they're forced to work by flashlight as they try to save a teenager whose hand was blown off in a Russian strike. Without power for the elevator, he has to be carried up six flights of stairs on a stretcher to reach an operating room lit with only emergency lights. It's hard without an elevator, hard without light to get the child to the sixth floor. No water, no heating. Working in the dim light, doctors amputate the teenager's left arm. His mother waits nearby, inconsolable. They shoot at civilians, at children. We didn't call them here and didn't kill any of their children, so why are they killing ours? But with Russian attacks continuing and winter beginning to bite, Kherson residents are facing shortages of water, food and other essentials. Many are making a difficult choice and joining the government's voluntary evacuation effort, boarding buses to seek safety further from the front lines. Let's get across to DW's Nick Connolly reporting from Kiev. Nick, give us more details on these latest Russian strikes across Ukraine. Well, these are genuinely on a massive scale of the kind we've seen maybe two, three, four times over the past month or so. Uh, dozens and dozens of cruise missiles uh, fired by Russian planes towards Ukraine. We got a sense of it early afternoon when those uh, planes, those Russian planes were seen, spotted by Ukrainian forces. And within a couple of hours, those missiles started hitting, starting hitting their targets here in Ukraine. Lots of the country without power, often enough without water, because obviously those water supplies are dependent on electric pumps. Uh, lots of places without centralized heating. We had a a heating plant here in Kiev that was hit, as we understand. I think the kind of situation here in Kiev is about, you know, pretty representative is what you can see behind me. A lot of darkness, a huge city of millions of people in darkness, but occasionally some street lights, some, uh, you know, advertising. It's often quite random and difficult to tell why bits of the city are still supplied with electricity. Um, often you're, you know, you'll find that your building is connected by a line to a hospital or some other kind of critical infrastructure and as such still has power. Uh, and you know, lots of people here still have the expectation that this is one of these attacks that will be uh, overcome in the space of, if not a few hours, then at least a few days. We've heard, though, that three of Ukraine's major nuclear power stations still in Ukrainian controlled territory have automatically disconnected themselves from the system as a security precaution so a real sense there that this is a very dangerous situation, a situation that can cause lots of unforeseen effects on this country's infrastructure and one that is definitely going to take a lot of effort to make good and especially in a situation where Ukraine is essentially running out of spare parts to keep the system going. Basically, we've heard in recent days that they are now 100% dependent on spare parts coming in from abroad because everything that Ukraine had, that has just now been used up. And Nick, the neighboring country of Moldova has also been reporting massive blackouts after those missile attacks. What's behind that? So Moldova and Ukraine's energy systems are very closely linked. 
before this war, Moldova imported a lot of electricity from Ukraine. Ukraine isn't doing that anymore in a large scale. It needs all the electricity it can get. But certainly lots of these, uh, you know, the, the kind of electricity cables, the lines, they are all connected. So when Ukraine switch things off to kind of stabilize the system, that immediately impacts Moldova. Moldova in itself is in a big energy battle with Russia, with Russia's Gazprom monopoly, uh, reducing deliveries of gas to Moldova now ahead of winter. Uh, Russian-controlled separatists in Moldova cutting supplies to government-controlled territory. So a real sense that Russia is putting on all the screws right now and at the same time as invading Ukraine, trying to get rid of a pro-European government in Chisinau in Moldova. That's DW's Nick Connolly reporting for us from Kyiv. Many thanks, as always. Well, I'm very pleased to welcome Anne Nguyen in the studio with me now. He's the head of the Ukraine mission at the International Organization for Migration. A very warm welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Your organization is dealing with millions of people who have been displaced inside of Ukraine. Um, can you tell me about what their situation is like facing a winter with these widespread power outages. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yes, exactly. I mean, we have around 6.5 million um, uh, internally displaced. Um, and the fear that we have is the longer uh, that the war continues, the, the, the increase of their vulnerabilities. Uh, we have around 45% of, of, the, of the IDPs reporting that their homes have been damaged. Five percent of those basically say that that their homes are completely damaged. We have more than 250,000 that are sitting in or, or staying in collective centers. One of the things that we're very worried about is what we call negative coping mechanisms that, that we see um, uh, being displayed, borrowing money, uh, spending less on health care, alternating their, 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 their source of eating. Um, and the, the biggest worry right now that we have is the fact that more than 50% of the IDPs have used up all of their savings. And so this is something that, that continues to worry because you know the cost of heating, the energy, the cost for them to stay where they are has increased in such a way that, that they become much, much more vulnerable, especially during the winter time. So these are really serious ripple effects. Um, we've had, heard some Ukrainian officials urging displacement Placed Ukrainians not to return to Ukraine in the coming months. Um, the head of a Ukrainian power supplier even suggested that civilians should leave their homes for a few months in order to reduce power supplies and demand on the energy network. It sounds like in these circumstances that you're describing, would you agree that that is something that you would recommend for them to do? Um, I, I wouldn't recommend as much as saying that I think that that it's... it's uh, people need to find alternatives for more sustainable uh, situations. Um, there are people that have the ability to move to their dachas, for example. Uh, one of the things that we've also seen is, as Ukraine is becoming more developed, the, the, there's more urbanized populations, and they're so dependent on the central heating. Um, as the reports have said, uh, I think the Ukrainian population is much more resilient than we see it. There's much more patience, and so we haven't seen yet this this um, this flow moving outwards because I think that that there's a sense of solidarity for them to be able to to stay in Ukraine and and stay in in, in their their primary residence. And even with this tremendous resilience, as you and I speak today in the mm. studio, and we know that Russian missiles are raining down around Kiev. Um, do you think that Russia? is deliberately seeking to make life harder for Ukrainian um, civilians to make I it can't, impossible. Even. I can't speak to the approach that the Russian Federation has, but I can speak to the fact that the impacts are great, especially for the civilian population. Since October 10th, we've seen such an increase in terms of attacks towards infrastructure that has significantly impacted not only the IDPs, but all of Ukraine. Um, we've all have been impacted every single person in Ukraine has been impacted by energy, has, has also been impacted by, by, um, by shortages sometimes of running water. And so it, it is um, something that is of, of big concern, especially for the humanitarian community in terms of how do we take a look at responding to, the, to the, those most vulnerable and those who, who really need as, as much help as we can provide. Okay, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me on DW News. That's Anne Nguyen uh, from the International Organization for Migration. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it.